It's time to talk about the story and the setting of Dragonflight. You're going to learn a lot today, especially if you don't really know how we got here. And there's something that I noticed immediately. The Watchers look like old Watchers. The Titan architecture doesn't look like the modern techie stuff of BFA and onward. No, it looks more like Gul'dan, more like Ulduar. Places a bit more classic to the game's setting. So this expansion is going to be taking us back to lore that is rooted in the 2000s. And I'm actually really, really keen for that. So today, you're going to learn just about everything, and I'm going to kick it off with how the Dragon Isles actually fit into the timeline and the canon of World of Warcraft. Okay, these islands, where'd they come from? What's going on? There's a lot of unanswered questions, but here's the TLDR, okay? A long, long time ago, the Titan Watcher Tyr noticed that Galakrond, one of the drakes, grew to an enormous size, feasting on the other drakes. Well, uh, five other drakes, then, who would eventually become the original dragon aspects, they banded together, and with Tyr, they ended up defeating Galakrond. Shortly enough later, the Titans uplifted them, charging them with protecting the world. Now, this is all covered in the book Dawn of the Aspects from, seriously, like, ages ago. I mean, Alex Straza is mentioned in the Manual of Warcraft 2. But that dragon novel doesn't mention the Dragon Isles, does it? How did this happen? Well, I think the dragons very much could have been uplifted and given their charge on the Isles. It would make sense, given the Isles' titan tech, and... I mean, it's clearly set up to be the seat of draconic power. At the very least, after the uplifting happens, the dragons then relocate to the Isle as their base. And from this point, many, 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 many thousands of years likely pass. Then we get to the War of the Ancients. When the cinematic says 10,000 years ago, that's the time of the War of the Ancients. Now, all of that stuff with Sargaris was going on. Around the same time, though, Naltharian... Deathwing was being twisted by old god Whispers. So he finishes this project to build the Dragon Soul, and he betrays the rest of the dragons, but using the Dragon Soul damages his body so much that he's forced to retreat. Very shortly after those events, it all goes down at the Well of Eternity, and the Sundering happens. That's basically when the Well of Eternity does a big explosion, and Kalimdor is split into the continents that we see. Now, that very much seems to be when the cinematic starts. So as that happens, the Dragon Isles empty. The Watchers are powered down. They go dormant. If I were to speculate here, I would say that at this stage in time, Deathwing had just wreaked havoc on the other Dragon Flights. So they'd already taken a large hit. They've now seen the world really does need to be protected, but they also know that Deathwing is super powerful and he is at large. Perhaps you could say that the risk of helping the world is that they would be spread too thin and that perhaps that would leave their new home, the Dragon Isles, well, vulnerable. And given what's probably on the Dragon Isles, Deathwing getting control would almost certainly be a terrible thing. So that's likely why they decided to go out and help the world, but also to make their isle basically be completely hidden away, such that they could not even get to it. 10,000 years later, Deathwing, of course, has been defeated. The old gods have been defeated, and Azeroth is wakening. Koronos responds to this by lighting the beacon, as Alex Straza had told him and the other Watchers to do. So now, with the way to their home open, these dragons realize that once more, it's time to take up their charge. Now, the big question here is what actually causes Azeroth to waken? That's a good question. I think she's slowly been waking up, given all the crazy events that have happened to her. So we could say that this next stage in her waking up is either a direct result of Zoval's tomfoolery, or it's maybe a downstream effect of what we're going to see in the pre-patch, or perhaps in patch 9.2.5. Thinking about recent lore then, between the Doomsayers, the Zareth Mortis Oracles, and the various old god whispers, the awakening of Azeroth has been a long time coming. It's been obvious it's going to start to happen. Indeed, the awakening of Azeroth is really what the Titans always wanted to happen eventually. The whole point was to 
make Azeroth, you know, like, nurture the planet, keep it safe so that eventually Azeroth can, you know, grow up and become a big titan with the rest of them. And of course, that all reinforces the meaning of Alex Straz's line, you will feel our coming in the waking of the land. So quite a few things are waking up. We see this blue in the waters. Watchers and the Jardin, who are these elemental half-giant dragon killers. Between them and the primal incarnates, this expansion is going to be reaching very far back to the core of Azeroth. And that even extends to the races. As an example, we're going to see primordial trolls. Now, if you think about the canonical descriptions of the Well of Eternity, and then you look at the water that's brimming up in the shores of the Dragon Isles, well, that water is a bit Well of Eternity-like, and we're going to be getting some primordial trolls, and we know Night Elf lore will be involved, perhaps we're even going to find out how the Night Elves came into being. Indeed, Eyes of the Earth Mother says that Alun and Azeroth are mother and daughter. Taronda is featuring in this expansion, the Green Flight are featuring as well, they're going to have a similar story given Turhonda's recent history, so I think we can bet that the Dragon Isles is going to bring all of that lore together. So, what will precede the cinematic that we all watched a few days ago is the pre-patch. In that pre-patch, Alex Straza is going to send us to Uldaman. And between that and what we've seen thus far, I think it's very clear that the Titan story is going to be expanded. One of the things I liked the most initially was Koronos, the Titan Watcher, just looked so authentically titanic. He looked like the earliest constructs we saw in Alderman all those years ago, like straight out of vanilla. I think it's very telling that Dragonflight begins with the first Titan dungeon that World of Warcraft ever had. And the story of Alderman pretty much goes down like this. So we've got Lokan, the mad titan keeper from the Halls of Lightning, who was, you know, old god corrupted, all that stuff from Ulduar. He usurped Tyr's position as the head keeper. Lokan then tried to kill all of the uncorrupted keepers with yogg -Saron's minions. Then Arcadeus, he escaped with the Disk of Norganon, which basically is just a titan databank. He fled to Alderman which basically was just a stasis chamber for failed titan experiments. Many thousands of years later, the dwarves would discover Ultiman, and they'd really go in there to try to work out what was going on, because they were trying to basically work out their own origins. And what's intriguing is that the pre-patch Ultiman is going to have some previously undiscovered chambers. So who are we going to find? Who are we going to fight? Big questions, and I imagine we're going to learn more about Tyr, because, well, Tyr's cool. <laughs> he's, he's just a character I think that's always came off uh, quite well. And for all of this to happen with the discs of, Nor of Norganon, Tyr, uh, who also, we must remember, is the instigator of the dragon lore, because it was him who basically banded together with the dragon aspects when they were still basically kind of like proto-drake-looking dudes. Um, you know, he really created the dragon lore and he ended up sacrificing himself to uh, defeat yogg uh, servants, of course dying in a place known as Terrasfall. Yeah, that's what that is named after. So architecturally, this is all extremely classic Warcraft, and this kind of ties back, this expansion's lore ties back to uh, some of the oldest stuff in Warcraft. As I said, Alex Straza was even in the Warcraft 2 manual, and when we look at this, it's like Ulderman, WoW's first Titan dungeon. To me, that sets, I think, a pretty good tone for where the lore could go. But okay, enough of this history stuff. We've got some more modern events to talk about. The Dragon Isles have always been in the background of the game. It's something that we players have speculated on for a long time. We've seen the very early concept art of the Dragon Isles from vanilla, even the old development drawings of where, where it could be on the map. Though where part of our story today starts is actually 12 years ago, in the Badlands, where the red dragon, Rhea, was experimenting on some black dragon eggs. She was able to cleanse one of these eggs of void corruption. That egg hatched into Rathian. Rhea, of course, died protecting that egg. And after a rather disastrous attempt to ready Azeroth for the incoming Burning Legion uh, invasion, but funny enough in a way where Rathian's actions actually directly led to the Legion invasion happening because he kicked off the whole time travel plan. Whoops. Uh, he then turned his attention to locating the Dragon Isles, 
using his network of agents, and then, in BFA, us, to chase down some leads. And it turns out, the dragons weren't just being secretive. They literally did not know the way home. And that tells us a few things. I mean, Titan magic is wild. It can shape worlds. So perhaps the Isles reappeared in a different place. I mean, you'd imagine a dragon would be able to remember the way home. So whatever way this was sealed away from them was extremely hardcore. So that's how Rathian comes into this story and some of the modern attempts to locate these isles. So let's talk a bit about what could be going on. Okay, so dragons have got a really deep history and we're going to go into the most modern version of all that we know in the next few months on this channel. But for now, the two most important aspects to think about are the Cataclysm and the dragon's connection to Azeroth. So, Notharian, aka Deathwing, caused the Cataclysm, and that was all in Nizoth's name. Of course, we defeated him, and the dragons then decided that they had fulfilled their purpose, and they ended their charge. Which honestly was a strange move at the time, because apparently their purpose was to stop one of their own after he got corrupted by old gods, but that only could have happened if they were uplifted in the first place. So yeah, mm, the end of Cataclysm's lore was considered to be weird at the time, and it still is kind of weird. I'm glad they're stepping it back and bringing the dragons back. Now with that, their connection to Azeroth is going to be so much more important. At the end of Cataclysm, we had no idea that Azeroth had a world soul. We thought it was just an important planet that the Titans had been to. It's crazy how much things have changed since Cataclysm. And that means we're going to learn a hell of a lot about the dragons. Per Chronicle, the dragons are actually descended from elementals. Now, elementals come from the world itself. And the world certainly seems to power the Isles. Steve even tells us that the dragons hope elemental power will return one day. And that's kind of interesting, since primal elemental dragons who follow Galakrond are our very first antagonists. I mean, as an example of just one thing, the reason why the elements were so crazy and out of balance in Azeroth is because Azeroth absorbed the element of, of spirit, part of her being a world soul and all of that. So that even makes you think about what this relationship between all of these different dragons are. I mean, we know that there are dragons who basically don't want to follow the Titans. Could they have a more complex view of Azeroth, given how she absorbed the element of spirit and that threw all the other elements into chaos? I don't know. Point is, we're going to learn a hell of a lot because our understanding of Azeroth has developed so much since the last time we had super major dragon lore. And really today's video has been a crash course in the most important lore for you to know as we have this new expansion announcement. But we do have some more immediate questions. So Rathian, right? He wants to reestablish his flight. He wants to, well, probably take up his father's role as Aspect, but you know, do things right and not go crazy. But Steve actually questions that in an interview, suggesting another may be more worthy. Who? I mean, Ebonhorn, I couldn't see him challenging Rathian. Will we maybe find a group of uncorrupted black dragons on the Isles? Who is this challenger going to be? Certainly something is going to go down there. Another thing in patch 9.2.5, and I'm super excited about this actually, we're getting some Blood Elf quests with Salandria, who you probably don't know, but back during Orphans Week, uh, which I think came in in the Burning Crusade, uh, or at least it was the TBC iteration of that, uh, Bronze Dragons attack, because uh, we quest with Salandria as a child. Uh, Bronze Dragons actually kind of try to attack her if if she's brought to the Caverns of Time, but they're stopped by Zalur Dormu, who basically says, things she might or might fail to do in the future, you know, we, we can't attack her for that. So, with Salandria being brought back into the story in patch 9.2.5, this could very much be whatever villain she either becomes or fails to stop an interesting connection from the Burning Crusade to the Dragon Isles. Then we have the biggest question. Who's the big bad of this expansion? I mean, that Salandria thing is happening with time dragons. And that makes us think of a certain other group of time dragons. I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's refreshing not knowing the big villain. You know, it's just a big old adventure. But they've told us we'll discover our enemy through this expansion. Now, what we know is we're starting with the primal incarnates. 
These are basically these proto-Drake leaders who followed Galakrond. I mean, maybe literally, or maybe after his death. And maybe you could say that these are like, you know, primal or elemental drakes in, in certain parts of the Titan cosmology chart. Maybe Galakrond was like the one of them for like death and decay. Who knows? But maybe Galakrond could end up being the big leader. I mean, attempts to resurrect Galakrond have happened. The Lich King tried it. Alternatively, though, we do have Morazond, who is the time-twisted version of Nosdumu, who, of course, founded the Infinite Dragonflight. So, he was actually the end boss of the End Time Dungeon. But that was his future self. In our timeline, Morazond is yet to exist. He's an invader from the future. So, the story always has been that void whispers caused Nosdumu to go a bit mad, kind of promising a way to subvert his own demise. Well, he's not lost his marbles yet, has he? And the old gods are dead. I mean, ish, for now. So how's that going to make sense? It's interesting. Legacy, I suppose, is just a massive part of this expansion. But for the big bad and what we're going to be doing, I think it's going to be a bit different. Uh, Steve Denuser told us in a recent interview with Warcraft Radio that we are going to discover our greatest adversary through learning about the history of the Dragonflights. And that means there's a lot to find out about them. And what I hope I've been able to do in this video is explain how the Dragonflights fit in and perhaps spark some of your imagination as to the big, big questions. I mean, if Morazond is powerful enough to change the timeline, could you not say that could actually make him one of the most dangerous villains in Warcraft? Who knows? But I think there's a lot of interesting things to answer. Now, I'd be remiss to say or to leave out that after Shadowlands, I'm a little bit rattled with the lore. Now, the amount of times developers have used the word grounded, that they've talked about returning to a core Azeroth story, going back to high fantasy and kind of a bit away from the tone and direction that they'd maybe been to in Shadowlands, even that Chromie time is being extended to level 60 such that Shadowlands isn't actually even part of the new player questing experience. I have a duality. I have, you know, a few wolves fighting inside me. One of the wolves is pissed after Shadowlands and what I feel was a mistreatment of the canon. The others are kind of saying, well, hey, they're making all these good noises. So I think the best I can say is we'll have to see how it, uh, we'll have to see how it goes. Hey, if we all have a fun time teeing them up for a, a big hit, discussing all this fun lore and all the fun uh, possibilities, then, well, you know, we can end up being disappointed or it could actually end up being great lore, a return to form. I really do hope it is the latter because so much of this expansion does seem to be trying to be a return to form. I mean, borrowed powers, gone forever, it seems. That obviously means they know things went wrong. Perhaps that'll happen in the lore. Perhaps that's why they're being so keen to tell us this is a, it's weird to say a grounded high fantasy story, but in the context of Warcraft, I think we know what that means. Let me know what you think then, and what your theories are for who the big bad could be. With that, I'll see you next time. Thank you.